Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. We believe the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on today. Please help me welcome to the show, Mayor Neil Ellis of the city of Belleville in the province of Ontario. Mayor Ellis, welcome. Uh, good, uh, good day, Chris. How are you doing? Not bad. Uh, this is, uh, as I said in the pre-interview, this is sort of serendipitous for myself because you were the first mayor that I ever covered in municipal politics. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. But before yeah, small, we small world, you uh, you recovered. That was back in 2006, I believe. And uh, you no, know, it's good to see you again. So good to see. We're all you. looking a little older, though. <laughs> Certainly are. Gray hair is one of the things that has come with the territory. But Mayor Ellis, I want to Neil. I want to start with the question I've asked every municipal politician, and you're no exception. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, I think, uh, you know, growing up, obviously, uh, you know, it's instilled with my my parents. I uh, had a dad that served, uh, you know, through his life, whether it's World War II or, or being a fireman to, to uh, municipal services. But it, it looks like helping, you know, helping people. And my, my first political role that a lot of people don't know, I was uh, president of my uh, high school, Centennial Secondary School. And that's kind of where I got my feet wet and uh, kind of loved uh you know, shaping the school. So when I, I put myself in for mayor, it's kind of, I had a little city to look after when I was uh, in grade 13 and, and now it's a, a bigger city, but um, it's, you know, looking back, I, I think that, um, you know, if you complain or you're a, a arm cheat, uh, an armchair athlete or an armchair uh, politician uh, or person, it's time to, uh, if you want change to get involved yourself as, as opposed to being uh you know, maybe critical of, of past people, which I, I mayors, I, I try not to be. Um, but I ran on a, on a change and, you know, to change the, the way of the operation worked. And uh, in 2003, I, I ran the first time against an incumbent or not an incumbent, uh, a standing councillor with no experience and, and not in the sector at all for mayor, uh, rather than sitting on council. And, and it was one of the closest elections in the history of the city of Belleville. Uh, I lost by, I think it's 240 votes and, and actually won, in, uh, won on election day, but lost in the advanced polls and, uh, you know, got my skills honed uh, up a little bit over the, the next three years and, and ran again. And um, the issues that bothered me, I guess, and I, I you know, I, it was uh, some of the things I ran on was one of the big things were doctor recruitment. It, it obviously isn't uh, a municipal issue, but, you know, the province wasn't looking after it. So that was one of my planks of my platform. And leadership, um, I found over the last while watching councils, and and you'll see this in a lot of a lot of cities that um, they don't stay focused because of leadership, and they get off track, and uh, there's in-house squabbles, and it's and it's the public, and and that's what you know a lot was uh, shaped uh, with past councils. So uh, leadership to keep the council off the front page of the paper, and you know I successfully won in 2006. And uh, I think I lived up to, to most of my platform. We had a, a united council for the most part of it. We, you know, we didn't agree on everything, but uh, I lost a lot of votes, but didn't hold it against them. And uh, we got a lot of projects done that we can we can talk about later, but it's giving back to the community. And I, I think that um, you'll talk to anybody that's really here. It's, it's about shaping your future, getting back. Uh, they're not doing it. Um, you know, that's, I believe most people do it for that reason. We have a lot to digest in just that opening statement alone, yeah. but I want to start. I got off track a little bit, so. which is good because it'd be a very right? bad <laughs> interview if you didn't talk. Um, yeah. But I want to start with your upbringing. Was politics discussed at the dinner table, or was it more of that service to give back through volunteerism, whether it be that service that your grandfather you talked about? Um, was was politics discussed at the dinner table, and was it municipal politics that was discussed, or was it provincial and federal? Um, no politics really discussed around the table. Um, my dad, as I say, um, really thought a lot of, of mayors, uh, you know, and I, I think... Uh, a lot of times, uh, mayors back in the older days were maybe uh, held uh, to a higher, a higher level. And um, you know, as a as a child, he always uh, introduced me to the mayors of the day and and things like that. But there wasn't any. Uh, my dad, working for the city, never um, you know got political in the sense because obviously he had to have a, a job after or you know supporting any candidate. But uh, again, it was um, 
more so giving back, uh, you know, member of the Legion, service clubs, um, things like that. So I, I did have some touch points with, with obviously uh, politics just as growing up, I guess, is the, is the easiest thing to say, but um, not through a critical point, just meeting politicians. You you decide in 2003 that you'd, you were going to run municipally. You could have chosen provincial politics. You could have chosen federal. You could have chosen school board. What was it about that municipal level for you that drew you to it? Because I know you do run federally later on in life, but you start municipally. What was the decision municipally to get involved that at that level? And, and when I looked at it then, um, it, municipal councils in, in Ontario here, uh, have control of about 60, 66 to say 70% of services that are offered. So it's, it's high, high, high amount. So, you know, if the federal government went on strike, um, you probably wouldn't notice unless you work for it. Provincial government does uh, provide, you know, other things, but again, um, they're, they're high above us and municipal is where things get done. So, um, you know, whether it was build Belleville infrastructure programs that we announced and, you know, we can talk about buildings and swimming pools and things like that. You have the highest impact on your community. Um, you know, I left and, and we can get into that to another conversation and, and did two terms um, and, and didn't get defeated. I, I decided to, to move on to federal and part of my federal move was infrastructure and dollars coming to municipalities and we don't have enough money. And that's, you know, maybe a touch point uh, in the next uh, comp uh, next question. Um, so that was was the, my issue was to to look at social housing, housing and things that municipalities can't do that the federal government are in charge of. So I, I did go and, and leave the job. I uh, when I left, I told a lot of my staff I'd be back. Uh, I did love I, I maybe love is too too much of a term. I, I did enjoy my my federal time. Um, but you're you're flying at 30,000 feet, basically. And, you know, I had some extra roles uh, being a parliamentary secretary and that. But you're representing across Canada, so you're you're maybe I don't know if it's a small fish in a big pond, uh, but you don't see things that are you know they don't roll out quickly. And you know, for instance, federally, I had a private member's motion on ending homeless uh, veterans, and uh, that's uh, passed. But you know, they're working towards it, but we're looking you know five to ten years. So um, municipally, you, you can help people more. You're on the ground, you know, whether it's uh, somebody up in the East Hill that doesn't get their driveway done or, you know, a pothole, you can actually see accomplishments. And, you know, I think that means a lot to me to, to see those little wins. They're, they're little wins, but um, that means a lot to me, being able to help people. Mayor Ellis, I want to know what happened in 2003 that finally said to you, okay, now is the time. Now is the time to put my name forward and get involved municipally. And that's a very good question. I, I, 2003 seemed so long ago. And when I looked at it, it, it I had a, I was in, in business myself and I, I owned a, a bicycle store, uh, which we sold high. And so it was, you know, quite the store and I had a lot of employees and um, the store tended to be political. That's where we talked a, a lot about, and it was always municipal politics because, um, you know, we were more affected and um, 66 or 70 percent of the services, 65 um, are preside, provided by the municipality and uh, obviously local news covers local politics more so you you kind of get into the deep and weeds with staff and that and um, you know it, it came up uh, that I said you know maybe maybe I should give it a try and uh, my original thought was to, to run for council and uh, the mayor of the day Mayor Zagoras was retiring and uh, a couple of councillors were running and I thought well you know hey I, maybe I can do this job or maybe I can do this position so I, I put uh, put my name in, um, uh, you know, kind of a funny story. I, I never uh, mentioned it to my better half, Sue, and uh, had to tell her after the fact. Uh, that didn't go over well, and uh, she wanted me to get out, but uh, I registered on the last day, so I, I couldn't uh, couldn't uh, get out. And she said, you know, you're going to embarrass the family. And I said, well, I plan on winning. And uh, it was close. We won, our team won on election day. We, we lost in advanced polls, and it was uh, by 200 votes. Um, so somebody not being in politics uh, it was a, a great, uh, great run. And we were underfunded. We, uh, but, you know, we worked hard and, and, and got there. So what uh, was the decision that, running for mayor first off out of the bat? Like I can imagine if you're someone who's involved in the community, like you were going into counselor's position might've been the safe bet, but you chose, nope, let's go right to mayor. 
Well, and I, I think it, uh, I looked at, uh, and I, I guess just being high level, I, I looked at leadership and, and I noticed, uh, you know, part of it, the, the last few councils or, or a lot of them, there was a, a lot of controversies and, and, you know, I think uh, the leadership can't, you know, the top can't be blamed for that, but, uh, you know, they can probably try to solve it. So my campaign was, to, you know, basically my thought was, you know, we need to get council moving in the same direction and, and you know, from the outside, I didn't see that. Uh, one of the main things were doctors, we were lacked uh, 15,000 patients, lacked family doctors. And uh, there was a lot of talk about council of the day, taking care of that, but um, they didn't seem to be moving forward on that. So my, my platform basically was simple, was, um, you know, we'll, we'll recruit doctors and uh, infrastructure, obviously, it, uh, to, you know, fix our roads uh, and some of the, the not so fancy pipes and, and stuff and, uh, and leadership. And, uh, you know, 2003, it, it was close. Um, I, I come back after that. I had a lot of people reach out. I was criticized in 2003 three for not sitting on any committees and, and coming out. Uh, you know, that was my uh, what was used against me. And uh, after that, I had a lot of people in the community say, you know, we have a committee. Can you come sit on it? So uh, I did a little bit of background and worked and uh, I ran again in uh, in 2006 and, and was successful and, and beat the incumbent uh, on a landslide. And I haven't looked back since then, I guess. Uh, I want to talk about the first election that you run in, because you always remember the first time you go into that ballot box and you see your name. You see that Neil Ellis name, because I remember in 2010 when I was first on the ballot in Clarington, I saw my name and it gave me some shivers. For you, what was that experience like going uh, in and putting that X beside your name? I didn't vote for myself. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, uh, it, it, uh I guess, um, I don't know. I, I, sometimes I have to, to touch myself because I, I, you know, some days I don't even realize I'm mayor now. It's, it doesn't hit me hard like that. It's, uh, and you know, it, it, it basically, um, you know, it, it kind of hit me, but it wasn't about me. It was about the community. So it's, it's, that's the way I think. So, um, I've always put the, you know, the community ahead of, of the role. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, I guess a little weird, but you know, it, it, it wasn't something that I thought about. And even after I won, um, it, 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 or I lost that. It, I didn't, uh, the first election, uh, you know, I got up, I, I wasn't upset. Uh, we did well. I didn't finish third. And, you know, I think part of that was, uh, was Sue, my wife, uh, the night of the election or the night before the election, she said, you know, you should think about, uh, if you don't win and I went for a walk and come back and, you know, I said, as long as I finish second, not third, I'll be fine. And, you know, I did finish second and then, then went from there. Well, I want to talk about that night in 2006, because I was there on election night with you and I was covering the victory rally for 91 X news and loyalist college. Um, Take me through that moment when the announcement comes out and you are now declared the mayor elect for the city of Belleville. What goes through your head? Uh, it was pretty happy if you Google the picture of Sue and I and the family. Uh, you know, we all had big smiles on our face. Uh, it again, I, I don't think I was expected to to win. Um, you know, I've always kind of went into elections the last two, those two as as an underdog. Uh, we did win by you know, I think we got sixty six percent of the vote uh, that time with the team. So that shocked everybody. Um, and I, I guess the you know the other thing uh, it was you know it was a great feeling, but man, I had to deliver, right? So, I mean, the press were there and that was the first thing. And if you look at what I said was, you know, it's about building a council first and, and worry about my promises after and, and, and building a team. But um, a little scary, I guess, at, at the first going, oh my God, I've done this, right? So, but uh, a little nervous, um, you know, again, I had run a lot of meetings, um, you know, definitely knew the the local issues and, and running the campaign, but um, never really had to work with a senior management team and, and things like that because I was always self-employed, uh, and, uh, you know, we got along great. I had a great CAO to train me, which I was very fortunate, uh, Steve Hyman. And um, we got things done the first uh, first four years. You, you, you get elected on issues that are important to the people of Belleville. When in that 2006 election campaign, did you hear more macro issues or more micro issues, more independently personal issues like potholes? Or was it we need more doctors, we need better infrastructure? And do you still hear those macro issues in elections uh, concurrently from that 2006 election or are they more micro issues? 
No, more, and I guess probably both of each. Um, you know, it, it, it definitely, uh, you know, some of the bigger issues that we talked about was uh, obviously doctor recruitment, and, and most of that was like high level of, of infrastructure and fishing, you know, wastewater and environment. Um, but there are, you know, obviously a, a lot of little issues too, and um, but but more sort of the big picture of, of building a city and, and industrial land. So um, not really down in, into the weeds of the, the little issues now. You know, you have the odd person that say they were, you know, city staff aren't working or, or you know, something like that. But uh, overall, more big picture, I guess. When you walk into council chambers for the very first time as the elected mayor, there's a weight and responsibility that you have to put on your shoulders to make sure that the decisions you now make are the best to move your city forward, but also the decisions you now make around budget issues affect everyone's bottom dollar, whether it be their pocketbooks, whether it be their uh, taxes, their mortgages. How do you and how do you still put that pressure on you to make sure that every time you walk into that council chambers, you're making the right decision? That's a tough one, and and uh, that's a. I don't know if I can even answer that question, but uh, it uh, and I, I, you know, I I've always um, and going back to I've always treated people how I want to be treated or how you know you that way, and I think in decision making, um, you highly, you know, you have professional staff here, so you you have to be prepared, um, and counsel you you can't be a you know a, a dictator or anything because a lot of times my ideas or or you know maybe might not be the best. And, you know, if you have a great group of people around you, whether that's council or staff, a, a bad idea can, you know, sometimes be a, a good idea. But again, it's public input because that's what you're working for, the, the obviously the public. So um, I warn people that, you know, uh, social media, obviously on uh, that, you, you have a lot of followers and a lot of them are like-minded. So uh, that doesn't always work when you, you know, make decisions on, on polling on that. Uh, you have to get out in the community and, and get those connections. And I, I kind of set myself up with a, a, a group of people that um, I, I was able to bounce ideas off, not only council, but, um, you know, whether it's uh, some doctors I knew or businessmen or just, uh, you know, the common person uh, that, you know, like me from that background and, and ask them the right questions to say, you know, are we going in the right direction or is this something that we want done? Because you've got to be careful of, of uh, you know, small groups influencing your decisions. So, you know, I think part of my decisions is, how is it going to affect the, the community as a whole, as opposed to maybe a, a focus group that that's asking for the project? And, you know, as a whole, is it the best thing for the community? And, you know, we get back to you mentioned taxes. Nobody really wants uh, to, to, you know, them to go up, but to build communities, you have to, you have to have taxes. And, uh, you know, I, I think if uh, they're well spent and, and gone to projects uh, that you have formal, um, uh, you know, input from all, all the community, um, the decisions and and uh, are are better received, I guess. And um, I've always encouraged encouraged on the council floor. I, I say, you know, if you debate things, um, we shouldn't debate things because in debate there's winners and losers. Um, in we should discuss things and come out with best public policy. And I, I just hate that word debate. And, you know, I used to, in the old days, I, I would stop them and say, you know, we don't debate here. Uh, and, you know, I had my uh, other councils that, you know, that's a, a, a word we shouldn't use. And uh, I see that so much uh, in politics and especially at the federal level. Uh, it's all debate. It's all attacking each other. It's, you know, uh, a lot of times you might even agree on the the opinion, but because you, you know, you, you don't like the person or your, your, you know, your political stripes, you'll, you'll argue uh, on the other side of it. And uh, I don't think it makes good for good policy. How much does respect come into play when it comes to municipal politics? Because I can imagine provincial and federally, like you said, there is that hyperbolic partisanship, but municipally, they don't care if you're a liberal conservative NDP block green people's party, they want the best for their city. Yeah, and, and definitely I, uh, in this past election, uh, you know, I had it come up at a few doors that, uh, you know, the, uh, my federal position and, and who I who I worked with, that, that was tied to me. And, you know, you always had to to enforce that, you know, this isn't my political stripes are gone. I don't belong to a party right now. I, I don't think I even hold a membership uh, because I got to be a zebra. And, um, you know, we have uh two two members here the the member that beat me federally uh, he's actually a friend of mine i went to his wedding a lot of people feel that's weird i was up in ottawa two months ago and i stayed at his house and people go you know you're with the mp that, that defeated you i go he's a buddy of mine so you know it's uh, you've got to work with him um the uh the mpp here was uh, a, a different stripe than i am too but mr todd uh, smith I, 
Yeah, and I actually, uh, to be known to that, uh, I encouraged him to to run provincially. And uh, so, you know, it, he owes me that. I don't think he'll ever admit it. But when I was mayor at the time, uh, they were looking for a candidate. Uh, and uh, I said, you know, here's a good guy. Go see him, Todd Smith. And, you know, he should uh, be paying me some money on that. But, you know, he's minister now. And uh, but uh, we all know that it's best to to, to go. And um, it, the the I, I the mayorship. Um, I don't get uh, the attack that I did federally. And, uh, you know, federally, I had a couple of death threats and, and things like that. Um, people tend to have, I, I guess, because you're in the community, uh, there seems to be mayors that are held at a higher level, I guess, than, than other politicians. And I, I think it's all about your community. And I always said to some of my federal friends, do never, never attack your mayor because they're loved a lot more than we are. So... You bring up one last good point before I turn to the city as a whole here. And I want to know, have you found that balance, that balance of personal life and public life? Because like you said, you're not in Ottawa anymore. You're not in Toronto working at Queen's Park or the House of Commons. You're in your community 24-7. So are there days when you go out and you have to be Mayor Ellis? And are there days that you want to go out and you just want to be Neil? You just want to go grab a... Yep carton of eggs and a thing of milk and just come home and not spend two hours talking to people and have you found um, that balance yeah and it's um people think i'm an extrovert but i'm not i i have to be in this role and i, I crash at night i guess and, and you have to do events and um uh, there's you know there's days that that um I kind of hide uh, after the the job and the role and I do the events and that I, I like the downtime um there's odd times I put sunglasses on and a hat to, to go for a walk um, just because, uh, you know, if I do go to the grocery store, I'll go and Sue goes, you know, you're gone for an hour and a half. Well, you have conversations all the time. And I, my children were young when I first become mayor and my uh, daughter, my younger one, I always knew to pull me along and she said, dad, we got to go. And, and people accepted that. And I went out with my older one one day in the grocery store and we got in the car and she was, she was crying. She'd have been about eight or nine. And, you know, why? Well, dad, you didn't give me any attention or, you know, mom, you're talking to people. And I said, damn, you know, I, I didn't tell you, you got to be like, you're younger, drag me along because it's hard to get rid of, you know? So you've got to watch. I, uh, I wore Todd when he was, uh, became MPP. Uh, I was guilty of having the Blackberry, the phone and, and on it all the time. And then I realized one day it, it clicked that once politics are gone, it's about raising your kids and your family. So I, I did sleep with my phone for the longest time. I, I do turn it off now or not off. I leave it on and, you know, check it. Like last night, I, I, uh, I you know, for four hours, I didn't look at it. And before I went to bed to, to look at the emails. But uh, you got to be careful because this politics can eat you up uh, when you love it. And uh, I think federally wise, uh, you know, the biggest divorce rate is, is politicians when you, you know, and, and I know the reason because you, you forget about the people and your family and um, you leave yourself open so much. So it's, uh, it's a role that people got to be used to being in, in the spotlight and uh, you're always mayor or you're always an MP or MPP. It doesn't matter. You can't have a bad day. And uh, you know, there's days that we all have a bad day. I, you know, and, I, I sit in my car to go into an event. I, I sit there for a minute and I put my smile on and, and get ready to go because um, you just can. And I mean, you, you look at uh, of things that, you know, politicians that maybe got an argument at a grocery store with somebody and that hits national news. And uh, yeah, it's a fishbowl. I want to turn to the city of Belleville as a whole now. And before I do that, I want to preface this statement, this question, by saying this. This is a question. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not an opinion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion at council. We seem to get a lot of hate mail from this question for some strange reason. Um, but Mayor Ellis, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Belleville today, as of recording? Um. There's a lot of issues and, and, you know, I think growth is, is one of the issues and, and we've always had growth even before I was, uh, and, and, you know, the first time I was mayor and we suffered from, you know, sitting at 50,000, 49,000 people, uh, 48 when you were here and, and that sign just kept at that and our growth was basically zero. Well, right now we're probably the fastest growing city in, in Ontario, if not Canada, um, you know, over the last three or four years, we're up, uh, we, you know, grown seven or 8,000 people. Projections look like it's going to be 2% a year going forward. Uh, growth is good. So, you know, it, it's two-sided. So the problem with having so much growth now is your infrastructure, your wastewater plants, things like that, 
don't handle it. You've got to find land and servicing and subdivisions and obviously bridges and, and traffic and, and that. So so growth is good, but now we're, we're experiencing the problems of growth, uh, you know, hiring more police, firemen, uh, old infrastructure. So it's a good thing to have growth, but it's it's uh, there's a double sided uh, edge to that. Uh, other issues that, that we face in, in most uh, cities that were built uh, back in the you know 1900s uh, are, are having aging infrastructure problems now we, you know whether it's clay or wooden pipes in the ground we still have some of that uh, a wastewater plant that was built in the 50s and these things now are uh, you know wastewater plant we're looking at 150 million dollars so how do you put that on a tax base of um, you know 25,000 people in industry because you know that's that's probably what we have uh, we need help from federal and municipal governments. So, you know, everybody's got to get aboard and all three governments need to work. But I bet you every municipality that uh, our mayor or councilor you speak to has that same issue, right? How to keep taxes low and uh, and fix, uh, fix the, the problems. And uh, I think you see it this year with tax increases uh, across Ontario with inflation. Uh, they're coming in, you know, the highest that I've, I've ever seen them. And that's not even putting money into infrastructure. And the cost of fire trucks have doubled in the last three years. Uh, cost of you know snow plows and, and all that. You're into a million dollars for a fire truck. So uh, we have good growth. We you know one percent in taxes is brings us in uh, you know well over a million dollars. But smaller municipalities, the one percent might only bring them a hundred thousand dollars, which does nothing. So the double digits, people don't want to hear it. Uh, but you know they're coming to a lot of smaller municipalities. Uh, and the other thing, uh, we go back to doctors. We had we had solved that under my council, and uh, the growth has hit. And doctor retirements uh, has, is that that's in, in front of us again. Um, other things such as industrial land, we are we have a heavy base in industrial as as well as in agriculture. Uh, my council back uh, back in 2006 expropriated uh, land, and we serviced it. But we didn't service at all. Now we're out of industrial land, so we're looking at another, you know, twenty to thirty million to to service that. It's it's good because industry's coming here. We uh, we have a million foot square house uh, warehouse being built right now by a company I can't say, but um, you know we are positioned ideally, you know, halfway between Toronto and Montreal, which I find now we're getting a lot of warehousing uh you know whether and i can't say the bigger companies that they're using double as a as a, a distribution uh, uh, warehouse so um so little pinch points on industrial and uh infrastructure in general and you know services that we're going to need uh you know there's talk now of uh do we need an indoor tennis court do we need uh you know different types of field whether it's cricket or bocce ball and, and things like that because uh, our city's changed. We've had a lot of migration and, and immigration, uh, which is is great over the last five years. You talked about infrastructure, and I want to jump into that section for a quick second here, because you're right. A lot of mayors and councillors are saying infrastructure is a big issue for them. Growth is a big is issue for them. But they're also saying there's pushback from the community about the nimbyism. We don't want our community to grow. We don't want it to expand because we like it the size that it is. Is Belleville facing that issue right now? Is there a lot of nimbyism in your community? And if so, uh, how do you fight back? Not, uh, there was a little bit when I was uh, mayor last time about you know keeping the, the small town feeling, but uh, as you're well aware, if you if you sell it in the right way or explain that, you know, we have to grow for more people or your taxes are going to keep going up. So, you know, obviously growth is is good that way. So you can either have two, 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 two things or, or two opportunities and other, you know, to, to build things like when I became mayor, we didn't have a swimming pool. We didn't have modern rinks and, and, and an aquatic center. So um, it was that, you know, do we have enough population to pay for this? And, you know, we did get it done and, and it's great for the community. But um, the Nibbianism we're finding now is, you know, more so subdivisions and, and people that uh, because obviously the subdivisions are now going on to land that wasn't used in close neighborhoods. Uh, we do have some Nibbianism. Obviously, most cities are are facing uh, a homeless situation or, or, you know, people that need shelter. So, uh, you know, we have been the public center of, of building some housing and uh, that's a little bit of nimbyism there with uh, transitional homes and things like that. But I think you see it more in subdivisions in the sense that uh, people don't want an expansion there. And uh, we had one uh, come in front of council a month ago, but once planning decide and, and, uh, and council, if they do turn it down, 
there's a, a mechanism to challenge council and it, it's a very expensive. So, you know, council has to rely on staff and uh, we can't take nimbyism into a factor in planning or we're going to cost the taxpayer some money. You, you you live in a community that is very diverse. And I remember from back in my days from 2004 to 2010, when I lived there, that it was a very diverse community with different opinions. And I say diversity is a good thing because it is. How do you as mayor and council look at the diverse opinions? Because if I go talk to 100 people in your community and ask them, what's the biggest issue? They're going to tell me the pothole. They're going to tell me the park. They're going to tell me the pool schedule. How do you take the individual issues and look at it as a bigger picture and decide at budget time who the winners and losers are when it comes to your pothole is going to be fixed. Yours might not until next year. And how do you do that? How do you balance the needs of your community with the growth of your community? Okay, and uh, we kind of had that before when I when I came to mayor first, and and we sat staff down and said, you know, we need to come up with a capital plan, and uh, uh, we sat down with council and we did a session of, here is our uh, wants, uh, I guess, and some of our needs, uh, but they're all mixed up in a map, uh, you know, a police station, a fire station, a pool, and there was no layout of okay, we know we need it, but what year is it going to happen? So I basically, we sat council down with uh, the CAO and staff and we, we voted and we explained, uh, staff explained, you know, this is why we need this thing. And we did priorities and we did this basically out of the, out of the gate. And, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the, you know, police station was first, uh, we, I don't know, fire was first. We had uh, a bridge that we built, a huge bridge that connected uh, Veterans Bridge, uh, a huge project that was a major transportation link. And that was uh, one that, the last four councils were struggling with one mayor wanted it, the DAA, the next mayor canceled it. And so we had that and then that went out to public and we, we got feedback on that. The second term, uh, what I found that actually would have been the second term, I had council uh, going, you know, they were voting against stuff and I'm going, you know, you voted for the police station, you voted for the fire station, but now you're voting against it. Well, you know, I'd rather have the fire station. So if I vote for police, I'm not going to get fire. And they had that mentality. So I sat down and did a program called Build Balvo, which was over $100 million. And I took all the projects and laid them out, showed council how they could pay for them and said, here, you know, vote for the fire station because your police on schedule for the next year. This is how we're going to pay for it. And we're going to get everything done. And that uh, was Build Balvo. It was written up actually across Canada uh, for the infrastructure to, to take care of it. And uh, it, it pretty well took care of uh, over half of the infrastructure. I, I wished I would have come up with the whole plan and I did have it to finish it all off. But I took a lot of criticism from Chamber of Commerce, the public, once they heard, you know, else is going to spend $100 million. And I went out and, and sold it uh, and everybody got aboard. They realized the Chamber and, and, and the public go, you know, you're doing this and the interest rates are low. Uh, infrastructure is going up by 6% or 7% a year. Interest rates are two. So the longer you leave the project, and old councils were, okay, we'll save money and build the project. Where I said, that's wrong. You should build the project, finance it, and the people that are using it now are paying for it. So that's how kind of a pivot switch that we did when I became mayor. And that's, you know, carried through. Uh, the build bubble was to get them on focus. Uh, we started it and then I left and there's still projects. So it's basically eight years and there's a couple projects left. But the next council come in, it was uh, a mayor that sat with me and voted on Bill Belleville and, and worked on it, doing the downtown, doing the police station. We did the fire stations over that. Uh, there was wastewater work that now I'm going to do that was on there. And we passed that last thing. But it, it, it had a plan. Now council or, or staff now are working on a, a new 10-year capital plan. And it'll be their priorities. We'll sit and look at it. Maybe we can ship one thing to, to another. Uh, but we'll get buy-in and, and I'll go out and have to sell it with the public. And, you know, the reason for the 10 year plan is to try to keep I, I'm not going to be around forever. I, I'm hoping to do another term if I'm lucky um, is to keep focused and say these projects are done instead of, you know, all of a sudden, OK, we're going to build an art center, which we didn't have on. And that's going to come in or we're going to go do this because, uh, you know, I ran on it as mayor. Well, yeah, maybe you ran on it, but that isn't probably the main reason you got elected. And it's just because you and, you know, I. Uh, you got 30% of the vote and you're, you're building this just because and you've had no public input uh, and it's not needed because it maybe needed, but these things are needed first. So that's the reason I'm trying to get that plan out that, uh, you know, I could stand up in this last election. It was a classic example of the, the incumbent I ran against. 
uh, come out the week before and said he was going to build an art center. Uh, you know, it's not in the business plan. It's not even talked about. And meanwhile, I'm sitting at, uh, you know, the debates going, you're building an art center for 40 million and we got uh, shit in our drinking water. So, I mean, we got overflows into the bay. Uh, that's, you know, it, it's not good. And uh, we, we need to fix that. So, you know, we're coming out with 13 million to get out of it, but people don't realize that, uh, you know, your wastewater plant, if it's not, uh, you know, close to capacity when we have heavy rains, I believe last year there was four uh, uh, partially treated sewage into our drinking water that the plant goes on an overrun. And then, you know, the plant warns our drinking water plant to turn up the chlorine. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's something that's not good. And uh, I think that was part of uh, the election that people went, you know, wow, this this guy wants to fix things that we need to be done as opposed to just what somebody wants. And, and I think that that's, uh, you know, people don't mind spending money on, you know, infrastructure like that, as opposed to say, we're going to build this, an art center that, you know, only so many people, and, I, and I'm for the arts, but it, we have the Empire Theater here. We have a lot of the private sector in. And, uh, you know, my my question is, do we need to spend $50 million on, on that when we're, we need 150 to, to fix the plan? How important is it to be realistic in municipal politics? Because you, you, you get a set up a good point of you don't you, you someone wants an art center. It's great. But being realistic with the tax base of how many people are in our community, do you really need an art center when you don't have enough uh, funding or you have other projects that need better funding quicker before we even start looking at the pie in the sky issues? Yeah, and I mean, uh, you see every city kind of get off balance and, and put a project in. And, and, you know, I always say like an art center would have been, you know, $45 million. Uh, sure, the city could pay that off, but it's the operating costs that kill you. So you look at something like that, that's probably not going to be profitable when I look at, you know, other municipalities like Kingston. So now you've got an operating cost for, for the rest of your life of the art center. And, you know, that could be millions of you know million or two million dollar loss or funding that's two percent your taxes let alone the actual paying off the capital so you've got to be careful about operating the gift that keeps giving and uh, you know that's what uh, council and i uh, were concerned about uh, when we built the pool but we ended up closing two arenas that were uh, single ice pads that were on each side of the city uh, combined everything in brought all the employees in and i think to build a pool we hired two new people um uh, so condensing of operations work and, and you got to be cognizant of that also. So it's, uh, it is a balancing act some days. So I want to turn to my last segment because I am cautious of time here and I want to turn to tourism because I love tourism. I love talking about tourism. I love exploring and I love the city of Belleville because it's my old alma mater of Loyalist College. But in your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems that are in the city of Belleville that as a tourist people should stop in and see? Well, we've got everything for everybody here. And, uh, you know, that uh, that question, I'm glad you gave it to me ahead of time. Um, you know, there's uh, things from we used to be called or we're still called the walleye capital of, of Ontario. So a great fishing in the Bay of Quinney, uh, many tournaments from uh, a lot of uh, U.S. citizens or, or U.S. fishermen come in, uh, bass tournaments, walleye tournaments, uh, huge in this area, not only here in, in our community next door, the Bay is, is cleaned up. Uh, it's uh, was really polluted back 25 years ago. Great by the conservation and the federal government and, and it's clean water and, and a great fishing. Other things are uh, we're rated. We have a good golfing community here or, or, or great golf courses. Uh, one to mention is Black Bear Golf Course. It's a, a public course. So very uh, inexpensive to play. And it was rated 72 out of 100 courses across Canada. So, you know, you're looking at 100 golf courses from, you know, from coast to coast. And we have the 72nd golf course that's rated in Canada and it's a public course. So you and I can come, if you come down, we'll go out hundred bucks each, shoot some balls, have a few refreshments. Whereas, you know, if you're going to Glen Abbey or if you're going to uh, Rosedale and, and those clubs that are ahead of, them, obviously they're nicer, but uh, unless we got a hundred thousand dollar membership or 40,000 and, and all that, we're not going to get in. And uh, we have many courses that are, you know, not as high level of there, but the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce has started running golf packages and they've gone over very successful because, you know, there's a, a course next door, Trillium, they can come in. And actually, when I, I go to Black Bear to play, you look at all the license plates and they're, you know, a lot of them are from out of town and, you know, they've got sleeping or, or and you'll talk to some of them and go, you know, I can drive down from Toronto, a better course, cheaper green fees. And, and that's a great attraction. We have the Belva Senators, uh, American Hockey League team. So with the municipality being so small, 
to have an American League hockey team uh, is great. You know, when the, the Marlies come in, the building's always full. Uh, we see a lot of players, obviously, back and forth in, in the NHL. And that gets a, a lot of national uh, national coverage, you know, even in, in, the, in the States. Uh, we're known for festivals and events. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce does a lot of our festivals, and they were just uh, had awards for Diwali uh, event and won two festival awards across Ontario. So, you know, in a small town, uh, we have such festivals as uh, the Maldi Waterfront. Uh, you would have probably went that when you're here at Loyalist, uh, Maldi Culture, Cultural Festival. Uh, we have Diwali. We have a Caribbean festival now. Uh, these, you know, we're getting 10,000 people in to, you know, in a day in the park to, to watch these and from all over. So, you know, kudos to the chamber to, to win awards on uh, Diwali. And I believe Diwali was the uh, first time they had it this year, or, you know, it was small, uh, small the first time. And then the city got involved and it just, you know, it, it won an award. Uh, other things are waterfront trails. Uh, you know, councils in the past days, uh, were visionary when they, they built the trail. So we have a, a large section from one end to the other that you can walk on or, you know, your bicycle, things like that. Uh, and Glamour House, if you're a Glamour House uh, Museum, so a national museum here that uh, is celebrating a 50 year anniversary this year. So we have that and, and obviously we're surrounded by uh, tourism in, in the area. So uh, you know, to, to Hastings County, you have a lot. Uh, obviously, we're close to the county, Prince Edward County. Not that I want to give them a plug, but uh, people come to the county and they come to Belleville also. And this area in general, uh, I believe it was one of the top tourism areas in Canada or Googled. Um, you know, we're we're in the uh, shadow of Prince Edward County, but that helps us. And, and you know, it's a great trade off. We I know the mayor, we work together in economic development, sit on committees and what's good for our community is good for their community. So the Bay of Quinney works together and that's, you know, with Quinney West. So if you come down in this range, you can have a, a week of seeing things uh, not only here, but surrounding communities. And we have the hotels and we have uh, all the amenities that uh, that you need to have a good, good vacation. Uh, a lot of Airbnbs also in the historical houses. We have, uh, you know, a great East Hill and architect wise of, of all the buildings and, and things like that. Farmer's market still here, uh, fresh fruit, vegetables uh, three or four times a week. Uh, the Quinney Sports Center that I spoke about where uh, we have a pool that's recognized as one of the, the best pools between Toronto and Montreal. Uh, swimming meets uh, are packed there. People come out from out of town and look at the facility uh, it you know just amazed at how it, it is it's a, a people friendly community uh, uh with with uh, you know the senators play there we have hockey there we have a fitness track uh and, and all that so that that brings uh, brings a lot of people we have in our parks uh, a lot of parks we have pop-ups uh, uh that a uh, past council put in uh, for events for vendors uh we have uh you know things like uh, disc golf now that last council put in that's been big. Uh, I don't know how if it's if it's caught out in your area. A lot of disc golf players, uh, you know, curling, all all lawn bowling. So we you know we we cover the everything. We're a small town, but or a small city, I should say. With a we're we're a medium sized city with a small town feeling, and uh, you know it's great to have this good community. So where do you go after a long day at work? Where do you go after uh, well, a stressful council? Like, is there a local watering hole or do you just like to curl up with a good book at yeah, home? Well, we got to watch, <laughs> uh, we got to watch under the municipal act that five of us don't go out after council because you're not allowed to hang out. But, um, you know, after last night, I, I'm a, I can't, well, I'm, I'm a Leaf fan too. I'm a Senators fan, but uh, the, the Leafs were on and uh, you could tease me as they got uh, Buffalo beat them last night. Uh, do a little bit of golfing. Uh, I walk a lot. I try to, to walk an hour and a half a day through you know our trails or through the communities and uh, or through the community and, and get out there. But um, I've got to watch it. You know, I, uh, it's seven days a week this job basically. Uh, you know, to try to schedule for some time off. Uh, my brother and, and family. I, I don't have a cottage, but uh, the three brothers have a cottage on a family lake. So I, I get to enjoy their cottage without paying for it. So I I end up going there a lot on. Uh, uh, my brother lives alone, so I, I've got a free free reign. The odd day I have a bad day, and I'll cancel everything and say, "Richard, I'm coming up tonight, and and uh, we'll do some fishing and things like that." So, yeah, you try to look after yourself. Uh, some days we're all guilty of not, and uh, but uh, there's lots of stuff to do. And I catch the odd senators game also. So, my last question for you here, Mayor Ellis, is this, and it's the most important question at the end of the day. In your opinion, what makes the city of Belleville a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? 
Well, it's a it's a friendly city, and that's our our coin of of friendly city. Um, it's a city that cares, and and I think we we still have that small town feeling. Uh, we have the greatest volunteers. I see when I go to events, uh, and I you know I've spoken to a lot of other mayors and 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 politicians, and they don't seem to have the volunteers we have. And uh, you know whether it's accepting Syrian refugees, Ukraine, we are one big happy family here. We look at the price of obviously land and property uh, is is inexpensive compared to to bigger centers. Um, so you can come and not have that financial, uh, I guess, constraint of a huge mortgage. Uh, you know, I spoke to somebody today that you know their house is worth about 1.5 million in Toronto, hour and a half down to Babel, they can buy a similar house for six or seven hundred thousand uh, dollars. You know, that cost of living is is very reasonable. Uh, you can drive like today, if I forgot my lunch, I can, you know, drive home and drive back in 10 minutes. So, you know, the city, they're coming into these 15 minute cities. Our, our city is that basically from, you know, even. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't be, don't be saying that too loud because we no. get the out in Alberta. That is a very toxic two words. And it's just... toxic. I shouldn't have brought that up, but uh, no, it's not, I'm not saying I support it or not, but I, that's a, a good coinage, right? But it's, um, it's it's you know we've got everything we've got uh, a, a lot of things going here uh, a lot of good companies so when you look at our, our industrial park uh, you know Procter and Gamble Black Diamond Cheese Auto Systems a huge amount of huge employers there Kellogg's have a plant there so there's good jobs here good paying jobs uh, which helps also we have um, you know the air base which uh, a lot of people in this area obviously it's halfway between here and the next community. Uh, but we have a lot of people that come in that that live in our community. That that's the biggest air force base in in Canada. So in general, you know, I promote the city. I'm kind of promote the the area also. Uh, and we have private schools if you you know you're interested in that to to raise a family. We have daycare, all those things that you know maybe you stretch for in bigger cities. We've taken care of that, and you know that's through the private sector. Uh, we have shopping here. You know, obviously. Uh, you know, the bigger stores are here. The franchise is here if you're interested in that. Good old uh, Quinny Mall. <laughs> yeah, Quinny Mall. And uh, when you come back, wait till you see uh, the strip. It's, I mean, we've got every fast food franchise in, in Canada there now that's come. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's it's a growing place. Uh, it has a, a college, you know, Loyalist College, a, a fantastic college now that's getting into degree, degree programs. So they have a nursing degree program. Uh, they're, at, they're at their highest enrollment ever. Uh, so we have the educational uh, educational facilities. Uh, you know, churches also religion is important. Uh, we do for for a lot of people. We do have those facilities that have popped up for for different uh, different religions. So, and I think you know when you come here, uh, it's easy to get if you want to help the community. It's easy to get involved because it's 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 a smaller community. Uh, so you know to get to know people. Uh, it's a lot easier, I think, in, in this community than bigger centers. Mayor Ellis, I want to thank you so much for sitting down for the last 45 minutes, almost an hour, talking about the city of Belleville and yourself. It's been an honor to catch up with you since our last chat, probably back in 2008 when I last was in covering yep. politics for 91X and Starboard's Communications 95.5. But thank you so much. Thank you. And I think I have an interview with uh, your old Loyalist College channel uh, coming up this week. <laughs> there you go. So with that, this has been the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. I want to remind everyone, get out from behind social media and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy. And of course, it helps us be a better people. So this has been the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember one, keep talking. 